Uh, hey everybody, this is Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our uh, lecture of the week. It's not really great players of the past or great players of the present, but it's sort of it's sort of like great players of the past with an extra S because this lecture is going to be about a very specific match between Deep Blue and Gary Kasparov. Now, this this lecture was confusing to me because this match happened in 1997. So my recollections of what happened um, aren't what happened. So the score is what I thought it was. The, the games were what I thought they were. But I was under the impression, and I'm obviously wrong. Um, somehow when you remember things from 25 years ago, they're wrong. I was under the impression the first match that they played um, in 1996 Deep Blue wasn't called Deep Blue, it was called Deep Thought. So, there's two possibilities. I'm right, which seems really wrong because nothing says Deep Thought. Everywhere I went says Deep Blue. Okay, and the other is that he did play Deep Thought, but that was before, and Deep Thought was the predecessor to Deep Blue. So Deep Thought and Deep Blue are the same thing, but Deep Thought was before. And then IBM changed the name to Deep Blue when it got better. So my recollection from 25 years ago, which I guess is wrong, is Kasparov beat Deep Thought the first match, and then he lost the second match to Deep Blue. The internet is telling me both of those matches were against Deep Blue. So he won the first match against Deep Blue in 1996 in Philadelphia, and he lost the rematch, which is the match everybody knows of. Nobody knows about the first match. Nobody cares about the match Kasparov won. And it's, they only care about the one he lost. Okay. Now, after he lost the match, they dismantled Deep Blue and it never played chess again. So, I, I don't know. Okay. Now, uh, if you go to the internet, it's very difficult to find information that I know from a long time ago about um, the controversies that happened in the match. Um, and those were very interesting. Now, as you all know, except none of you know it, um, one of the smartest people who ever lived, his name is Ken Thompson. So if you're watching on YouTube after the fact, which most of you are, pause the video, go, go to the internet, look up Ken Thompson, and then compare your life to his and then start crying. Okay, Ken Thompson basically invented everything. So if you do stuff, it's because of Ken Thompson. It doesn't matter what you do. If you watch TV, if you have like, like a nail clipper, it, it, whatever you did, Ken Thompson, is, that's the reason you're doing it. And Ken Thompson was invented, um, among other things, a version of C, Unix, and table bases. And he's also a good chess player. And uh, he was asked to be the special arbiter of the second match which is the match we're gonna concentrate on, the match that Kasparov lost. Now, if you go to Wikipedia, which I normally do when I give a lecture, you'll see some good stuff, and there's a lot of good stuff. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on Wikipedia on this match. You can probably learn more from reading this than from this lecture, because they got a lot of stuff. Okay, they talk about each game, they talk about both matches, the one in 96, which I thought was Deep Thought, I guess Deep Thought was before that, and the rematch, which is the match we're going to talk about. Um, what they don't talk about um, is the controversy. If you want to see the controversy, they have a link to the documentary film Game Over, Kasparov and the Machine, which I've seen. And when I say I've seen it, I've seen it before half of you were born. I saw it a long time ago, so I could probably see it again and be like, oh, I don't remember any of this. Okay, and, and the controversy was... Kasparov was convinced that um, the deep blue team was cheating during the match. And by cheating, what he meant was the opposite of what we mean by cheating. When you play on the internet and you accuse your opponent of cheating, which you always do, whoever you are, what you mean is you're playing a human and they're using engine assistance. That's what you mean when people are cheating. And if people use engine assistance, um, they play better than if they didn't. So that, that's cheating. Kasparov did the opposite. 
Okay, he was the world champion. So when he accuses you of cheating, it's confusing. He said the computer was using human assistance. So there were some positions in the match where Kasparov thought the computer played non-computer moves. They were human moves. And that those moves were better than a computer move. Okay, if you're confused, good, because I'm also confused. Okay, uh, wait, somebody's in the waiting room. That's not good. Okay, no, no waiting. All right, sorry about leaving in the waiting room. That'll teach me. Okay, now, before we talk about any of the games, I want to thank our sponsor, Patrick Davenport. Happens to be a friend of mine, watches the stream on Twitch, and he's also a moderator, so he's probably banned you. So thanks for sponsoring our stream. And, and he's also a very good chess player. He's not as good as he thinks he is, but basically that's everybody. So he probably thinks he's 2100 strength. He's probably 1900 strength. So it's pretty close, actually. Um, but anyway, um, Patrick spo sponsored the lecture because he likes this match, obviously. Now, uh, I was told by Ken Thompson, who was the special arbiter of the match, Kasparov said, I want the printouts of the games showing the analysis of the computer because he felt at various times the computer was getting help from humans because there were grandmasters on the Deep Blue team that weren't the programmers, including Joel Benjamin, for example. And they said they couldn't find them and they lost them and it didn't work. And he thought that they were stonewalling him. And in fact, Kasparov was correct. They actually had the printouts and they didn't show it to him to make him upset. Psychological warfare. This is what Ken Thompson told me. As a, as a consequence, Ken Thompson resigned as the match arbiter during the match because he thought both sides were behaving badly, which you know, they were. So anyway, it's the only time in chess history a chess player has accused an engine of cheating by having human assistance. Usually, as I said, it's the other way around. Okay, now, as you all know, I, I hope you all know, since this match was played 25 years ago, um, engines have gotten stronger. Now, Deep Blue isn't an engine. It's not AI. It's a mainframe. So it's this monster, like, computer kind of stuff, right? And so, um, you know, it, it could take up the whole room and they have, like, a terminal. And nowadays... Um, you know, I have a computer on my phone, although I actually don't have a computer on my phone, but most people do have an engine on their phone or they got something else like that going on. And, uh, that's better now. So it's, it's been 25 years. So if I downloaded Stockfish on my phone and I played and I went at a time machine and played Deep Blue, I'm the favorite even though Deep Blue is this monster mainframe thing from IBM and my phone fits in my hand. It's been 25 years. So nowadays, if you have the best engines and AI and Alpha Zero and Alpha This and Stockfish That and Komodo Them and all that kind of stuff, if they played this kind of a match against the best players in the world, it's possible they would win 6-0, but the engine would win either 5-1, five, 5.5, five half, half, or 6-0. Those are, those are the three options because th things have changed. Okay, and we can actually analyze these games with current engines, which I did. <clears throat> so I have some more insight than my 25-year-old insight that I had before. Now, this may be confusing to a lot of you. First of all, you were already confused about other things. This is something else to confuse you because you may be thinking... Why is a computer playing a human a match? Computers crush humans. Well, this is 1997. In the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, computers did not crush humans. And in fact, the first time a computer beat a human that was 2000 rated in a tournament was 1982. And so in the 80s, computers got to 2000, 2200, 2300 strength. Okay, now they're 3,500 strength, 3,600 strength. So they got better. And um, this was in the 90s 
when computers were competing with grandmasters at the top level, but there weren't really a lot of matches. They just knew that if a top computer played a grandmaster, it would be close. But then IBM got involved and said, we have a lot of money. We have mainframes. We can make a strong computer that plays chess. And they did. And they had grandmaster help and programmers. And if you see the documentary Game Over, Kasparov and the Machine, which is pointed out here, you'll learn a lot more about the, the, um, the inside of the match, not the, not the games themselves. Okay, The games themselves are, sec are secondary. Now, unlike a lot of lectures I give, there's actually a lot of good web pages about this, not just the Wikipedia one, which I've had on the screen for a long time. Um, there, there, there's also Scientific American article uh, 20 years after Deep Blue. This was five years ago. Now it's been 25 years and how AI has, and they have a picture from the match when Kasparov was a lot younger and so forth. And then they talk about the controversies and deep thought and really good article. Um, Chess.com wrote an article four years ago about the match that changed history because before that, you know, humans were better than computers. And then when Deep Blue beat Kasparov, people thought differently. And there's a nice article there. You get a little picture of the, the, the terminal they used. And then the scores and the games and some analysis and so forth. And then, hey, get out of there. I'm trying, I'm trying to do something. Uh, okay, that's, that's all I had, actually. Okay, now I want to get to the games also because that's probably a good idea. So let's let's share the screen. And uh, I'm not, let's see, here we go. Okay, um, I'm not going to talk about the first match in 1996 except to say Kasparov won four to two. Um, out of six games, he got four points to two, which is pretty handily winning. He was clearly better. And they revised Deep Blue, more computing power, more Grandmaster power, and a year later, they were better. And this was played in New York City, of course, frankly. And this is the first game, uh, Kasparov versus Deep Blue. And Kasparov in the match with both colors was playing slow and solid. He wasn't playing a lot of tactics. And then... If he got to a winning position strategically or tactically, then he would play like Kasparov. Before that, he was just playing safe and not blundering anything. Okay, so this position, which is from the first game, um, white has a better pawn structure um, and white's king is safer. Black doesn't have a G pawn, um, so he has an isolated H pawn. And white's knight has the opportunity to go to F5 as a consequence at some point. So if black doesn't want that to happen, uh, black is gonna have to give up the two bishops or give up something else. Okay, so in this position, uh, deep blue played F5, um, confusing the audience. And if deep blue doesn't play F5, white is gonna slowly but surely either get two bishops and have all the dark squares or play knight f5 once the knight's not pinned. Well, you can't take with the knight because the knight's pinned. So he took with the pawn and then e4. And this has really tactics the game up. And if you had the white pieces today against a current engine like Stopfish or Komodo or the AI, you know, you're probably in trouble with white. Engines aren't going to play this way with black unless it's good. They're not going to like, you know, go for a risk like this. But I think Deep Blue thought if it didn't do this, its position was terrible. And now this is complicated because the F pawn is pinned. Because the bishop is pinning the F pawn to the rook. And usually in positions like this, humans fall apart. They can't calculate all the tactics and engines calculate all the tactics so there's no problem now unlike most of you and by most of you i mean all of you um i've seen kasparov analyze more than once where he's sitting at a, an actual board with his opponent that he just beat whoever that opponent is i could name several people that i've seen this and then he analyzes and at that time i said kasparov's going to beat deep blue 
because Deep Blue doesn't see enough. Okay, and obviously computers see millions of positions a second, and I said Kasparov sees more than that. That's for me having watched Kasparov analyze. So if you're going to have White in this position and it's a big mess, you want Kasparov in his prime to be White because he can actually figure this out. Okay, and Kasparov played F4 because even though I wasn't streaming yet, due to streaming not existing, uh, always sacrifice the exchange. And Black is forced to take the Rook, otherwise Black's just down a pawn and White's going to play G4 and crush Black. So he took the Rook and he took the Bishop. And now uh, White's King is very safe and Black's King is not very safe. And this is actually a funny tactic that you would expect a computer not to fall into, and therefore the computer didn't fall into it, which is if you play the obvious H takes G, otherwise white has a lot of passed pawns, which is what happened, then white plays knight D5, which is something you would expect a computer to play, not a human. But in this case, a human would have played it. Notice how the knight is attacking the queen, and the knight has unleashed the latent potential from the queen on c1, which will soon become actualized potential. Okay, and I hope Andrew Tate is watching this lecture and understands the reference, although he doesn't, and he's not watching the lecture. Okay, and the idea is if you take the knight, then queen takes g5 check, and queen g7 mate is going to be the next move, unless black finds queen g6, which is very suspicious. Although it's still better than getting mated in one, I guess. I suppose. Okay, so you can't take on g5 because of knight d5. That means white's going to keep his two pass pawns on the fifth and sixth rank. So the engine played knight to e5, activating the knight, and then g6. As compensation for the exchange, white has the two bishops, white has the safer king, and white has two connected pass pawns in front of black's king. So this position technically is winning for white, but it's still very complicated. Bishop f3, bishop c3, very solid, making sure the rook can never come to d2. Now the queen can start running away. Queen b5, the queen wants to come into e2. Queen f1, Kasparov says, let's trade queens, and then I'll promote my two passed pawns. I wonder if he actually said that. They probably didn't say it. And they did trade queens. And black has a pass pawn of his own, but the knight is a good blockader. And those pawns on g6 and f5 really can't be blockaded well because I have a dark square bishop and you don't. h5, trying to stop g4. King g1, unpinning his bishop, getting his king to the center. Good move. King f8. And black just can't do anything. Black is just stuck. So white slowly improves. Eventually, Kasparov plays g4, so his king can walk up. So we have to we have, we have to stop the guy from playing g5. Although it doesn't really matter if you take on g4 because you're pinned here. So the, the g pawn's not really hanging because the knight on e5 is pinned. He unpins his knight. Rook g1 defending his pawn again, and they do a lot of trading. And, okay, these pawns are just way too strong. As you can see, and D Blue resigned, or the guys resigned for him, whichever is funnier. So that was a very nice technical win from Kasparov, who got an advantage, sacrificed the exchange, got two pass pawns, traded pieces, and pushed his pawns to the end of the board. And that was game one. So now, if you, from a historical perspective, if you go back in time, in 96, Kasparov beat Deep Blue 4 to 2, and this is game one in 1997, and Kasparov won with white and played a really nice game. So now nobody thinks, people are like, okay, back to the drawing board, Deep Blue loses the match, plays another match, loses the first game, okay, terrible. Okay, now after the first game, the match got very interesting. Okay, and this is, I think, well, 
you could argue it's either this game or the last game. I'm going to argue it's this game because this is funnier. The last game is less funny. This is game two of the match. So we saw game one. This is game two. And this was a Rui Lopez, which Kasparov typically isn't playing with black, but he's trying to play solid. And he's been strategically completely outplayed by the engine. And this is just winning for white. Black, like, is in stalemate. I mean, this is terrible. And in this position, um, white's threatening a queen e8 checkmate with advantage. Give, giving white a good position. Okay. He played queen b6 check. So he can't mate because you're in check. So then king to f1, which is a mistake. And when I say it's a mistake... Um, it's still winning, but king h1 is better. The king's actually safer on h1 than it is on f1, and you'll see why. Okay, rook b8, stopping queen e8 checkmate. Good job. Okay, now in this position, deep blue blundered, although you can't really call it a blunder. I just did, but it's my, it's my lecture, so I can do what I want. You can't call it a blunder because after the move deep blue made, Rook a6, Kasparov resigned. Okay, Rook a6 is one of the worst moves, and any other move that makes any sense at all is winning. So queen d7 check, queen takes queen, rook, rook takes rook. Like any move that's not rook a6 is winning. The engine says something like plus five, the, the engine today. Okay, I mean, black just has no legal moves. Black is completely trapped. Instead, he played rook a6, and in this position, Kasparov resigned. If he plays the obvious, queen takes queen, <clears throat> which he didn't do, pawn takes queen, my bishop's coming to d5, my rook's coming to a7, this pawn's going to promote, this pawn's weak, this pawn's weak, my king can walk up the board, and black has like no legal moves. Black is completely crushed. Black can't, has no plan. Black just moves back and forth with his king or rook and resigns. Okay. Now, if you don't play queen takes queen, your queen's hanging. And if you move your queen away, you lose your bishop. So Kasparov resigned. And Kasparov's been losing for a long time, so now he had a good reason to resign. And what happened was, uh, and this, you don't see this on the internet, but I remember because I remember. Um, people found out that this position is actually a draw. However, I found out today that it's not a draw. White is still better, but rook a6 is a blunder, and there's no reason for black to resign. And Kasparov would have had to play two brilliant moves in a row to not resign, and he didn't. He, he resigned. Okay, and this is very interesting analysis. Now, what happened was, it was actually published in the New York Times, and other grandmasters were talking about it, <clears throat> and Kasparov didn't know, and his seconds, Kasparov's seconds, were discussing, do we hide the information from Kasparov so he doesn't choke on his own rage, that he resigned in a drawn position, or do we tell him? And if we don't tell him, and he finds out, and then we didn't tell him, is he going to be mad at us? That's the kind of things the seconds think about during the match. And Kasparov could have played queen e3 in this position. Or I thought he could. Okay, queen e3. Okay. Where's my, where's my queen e3? Where, where'd it go? No. Oh, here it is. Okay. Queen e3. Now, I'm sure Kasparov didn't see this because nobody would. Queen e3, everybody would see. Then they would see queen takes d6. In this position, black has one move that continues the game. And if you saw this move, you would still resign. You would think that this move doesn't continue the game. But, but it does. And that move is rook e8. Okay, and the idea of rook e8 is to not get checkmated. Now, you can't play rook a7 check 
because the queen is stopping rook a7. So if you want to mate on the seventh rank by playing queen check on the seventh rank and then rook a7, so you can play queen g7 mate, that's why black played rook e8. And queen c7 check is the best move, and then rook e7. And this is the current engine line from the engine on my computer today. Queen c6, queen takes bishop, d6, queen check, king g1, rook e8, and rook a1 is the only move, otherwise black has perpetual checks everywhere. Uh, but this stops all the back rank checks. h5 is the best move for some reason. And the engine says white is up like 0.5. So probably if two engines were playing today, probably it would be a draw, but I'm not sure. Okay, and obviously Kasparov has to find all these moves. He has to find queen e3, and then he has to find rook e8. If he tries to perpetual check now, it doesn't work. And if he takes this bishop now, then rook a7 check wins, and queen takes rook check. And then my rook can go back to the first rank, and you can't perpetual check me because my king can just go hide on h1. My rook on a1 is stopping all your, all your checks. So the only way to draw, although I'm not 100% sure it's a draw, it's just worse for black, is rook to e8. Now, instead of playing queen e3 and rook e8, uh, Kasparov resigned. And I mean, if you're playing an engine and your, your defense is to sacrifice a piece and then play a defensive move, you would think that's not going to work. White's up a piece here. So how can black ever draw? Well, the reason is there's a lot of perpetual checks. There's perpetual check everywhere. For example, bishop f3, which looks pretty logical. You know, I, can, I got all these checks here. If you play bishop here, I have this check. I keep checking you on the dark squares. So there's perpetual check ideas. And the, the, it's amazing <clears throat> that you can play rook e8 here and just waste a tempo and whites up a piece and white doesn't have an immediate win. Okay, which the engines agree with today, white's slightly better. Back then, they thought it was just a draw this position. Um, I don't know if it would have been a draw if he had played queen e3, rook e8. We need alternate universe for that. But he resigned when technically he shouldn't have. But I personally, I don't blame Kasparov at all for not seeing queen e3, rook e8. That's, to me, that's crazy. So that resigning wasn't so bad. And the reason he resigned is for the last 10 moves or so, he's been positionally crushed and he was just waiting to lose. And if engines were playing today, um, the good engine now plays queen d7 check and says something like plus 5.6 or something. So, okay, I guess today's engines would win pretty easily and rook a6 is a mistake. And probably the reason was deep blue couldn't, you know, probably technically could see this, but couldn't see deep enough to see all the perpetuals and whether he was winning or not. Okay, turns out it didn't matter because Marv resigned. So, so Rook A6 was fine because it, it ended the game. Okay, and that's, to me, that's the most famous game, but a lot of people think the last game is the most famous game, which also has controversy. <clears throat> okay, now games three and five where Kasparov was white, we're going to skip, um, Kasparov was slightly better the whole game, maybe clearly better. The games went 40, 50 moves and nothing happened. He couldn't win and they got to just dead draw in positions and they were draws. Now this game is different. This is game four. Kasparov has black and double rook ending. And right away, you should realize that black is better, especially if you want used to be my student. Okay. And the reason is, in end games, especially rook end games, you look at the activity of the king. Black has an active king. White does not have an active king. In fact, white's trying not to get checkmated on the back rank. Okay, and obviously, black has connected past pawns, and white's pawns are scattered everywhere. But more importantly, 
Black's king is active and White's is getting checkmated. Okay, and the engine played Rook takes A7. Um, I'm a human and you guys are human, so let me flip the board. Okay, now we're human. Now we're Kasparov. Okay, and Black's going up the board and White's going down the board because we're Black. Just pretend you have the Black pieces. In this position, Black should be winning by playing like slow and steady, Capablanca-like, something like King C4, moving the King up the board. The Rook has to stay on the B file because otherwise Rook, Rook here is checkmate and we can play Rook B1 and stop the checkmate. So, okay, so we defend the Rook, C5, and Black's, Black's pushing his pawns. We'll make a move, takes, D4, and Black's pawns are just too strong. And, and Black, Black should be winning. They give a variation. Okay, you can, you can see Black has a king and White doesn't have a king. So D2 and the game's over. White's king does nothing. Okay. So the way to win was straightforward. Move your king up and move your pawns up. King c4, c5, d4, d3. Very simple. Okay. And engines today say, you know, plus a million. Black's completely winning. Okay. Now, of course, when you're a human, you get tired when you play the end game because before 1985, if you were a grandmaster and you were playing in a slow tournament, Typically, <clears throat> between moves 40 and 50, the game would be adjourned. After four or five hours, you would stop playing, you would adjourn, and you would play the next day, and people had time to analyze those games in the meantime, which doesn't seem very fair. Although it was sort of fair because everybody had a chance to analyze, you and your opponent. But what's not fair is we're playing the end game really well, because we have our coaches and our seconds and our friends helping us before we resume the game, that doesn't seem right that other people are getting involved in your game. But to me, it seems ridiculous, but that's, that's how I grew up. Nowadays, people are like, what are you talking about? We don't, we don't adjourn games, what are we talking about? Okay, but the World Championship matches until about 1990, you, you did adjourn games. That's, that's the way, you know, that, you didn't play nine hours straight. You played five hours and that was enough. Okay. <clears throat> because of this change where we don't adjourn games, after four and a half, five and a half, six and a half hours, you know, you could see yourself being tired when you're playing a computer that doesn't make any mistakes. You have to sort of be focused more than the typical player. You know, if you're 1,200 and playing a 1,300 and you lose focus for a move or two, maybe that's acceptable but now if you're playing an engine that's, you know, playing 2,800 strength and guys stay focused. Okay. So Kasparov played Rook F1 check, which is a mistake. Rook to B1 and then played Rook to F2, threatening Rook A2 mate. That's the kind of mistake I would make. I doubled Rooks on the seventh. I forced White's Rook to B1. That seems pretty good. Okay. And the computer played a really tricky move here which heretofore wasn't happening. And I guess Kasparov missed this because I would miss it. So, and I already know the answer. So if I know the answer and I miss it, I can see Kasparov missing it. And the move is Rook B4. And you're like, Rook B4, what does that do? It does two things. It stops mate in one because black was going to play Rook A2 mate. But now the king has B1, always play King B1. It does something else that will shock you. Okay, so make sure you're like sitting down in a nice firm chair. Don't fall out of your chair. White's threatening mate in one. Everybody's getting mated in one. Okay, because in the earlier variations I discussed, black was moving his king up. Well, not now. Now black can't move his king anywhere. So Kasparov has to stop mate in one. Truth hurts. Okay, so he checked. And he threatened mate again, and then they repeated and drew. Okay, so he didn't want to draw. He took the rook. Okay, fine. Rook e2. And this is just a draw now because white's king is getting not in the corner and the pawns haven't advanced. So black is still better, but white can still draw. d4 was the best winning chance, pushing his passed pawn. Kasparov played king c4. 
This gets rid of all of his winning chances. Rook c7, e6, e7, a4. White pushes both of his pawns. Black's rook can't stop both of the pawns. If Black's king goes over and takes the a pawn, then, then Black loses all of his pawns. So White has a very easy plan. a5, a6, a7, a8. And Kasparov's like, man, that's a good plan. So he attacks the pawn and threatens rook e1 checkmate. So stops the checkmate. Whoa. And then here they agree to a draw because White's going to win. So he can't allow that. And if you take the pawn, then, okay, then this is, that, that's pretty drawn. So Kasparov had really good winning chances in game four. This was game four. And he ended up drawing. And, and they drew games three and five in sort of a more boring fashion than this, where Kasparov had good winning chances. And that brings us to possibly the most famous game of the match. I like the other game where he resigned when he was drawing. But, okay. This is a very famous game, and this is the game. Um, and I'm, I'm going to be the computer here because the computer won. Um, this is a famous game for a couple reasons. So Kasparov played a line which is known to be bad, and then he played it badly. So he played a bad line, and there's more than one way to play the bad line, and he played bad. So he played extra bad, and this is probably one of Kasparov's worst games like he's ever played in a slow game. The Kasparov I know plays really sharp, sees a lot of tactics, plays very aggressive, plays novelties on move 20, and beats grandmasters with black all the time. This Kasparov got beat like a little punk. Like he played like he was scared. He played passive. He played a bad opening. And he complained after the game that maybe there was some cheating going on because a computer wouldn't sacrifice a piece for long-term compensation, even though the computer was programmed in this particular opening to do just that. It was told to do that before. But when sacrifice was allowed, he didn't think the computer would do it, so he wasn't worried about the sacrifice, he said. Okay, now... There's video where he's like goes ah after the sacrifice. I don't I don't know what to think. During the time, I thought maybe Kasparov was throwing the match because he played this game so badly, and maybe IBM said, "Hey, I want our stock to go up. How much money do you want?" I mean that didn't happen, but it sounds good. If you're a conspiracy theorist, there you go. Okay, so they played a Karo Khan, which isn't Kasparov's bread and butter with black. Kasparov when he was world champion, was playing a lot of Sicilians. Okay, and he played the knight d7 variation, very solid. And the old move is knight f3, but around this time, knight g5 was becoming popular. And there's some famous traps here, which obviously Kasparov didn't fall into. Kasparov played knight f6. One trap is if you play h6, I play knight e6. And if you take the knight, then you get checkmated. There's a famous game played around this time, by the way. I think it was before this game. Between Nunn, John Nunn, and Kirill Georgiev, which went like this. Queen check. Now, normally you would think just take the bishop and white's better, but Nunn played bishop d3. Georgiev blundered. Queen here check. And then played the move Georgiev missed, bishop a5. That's a tactic you don't see very often. <clears throat> the queen on h5, defending the bishop on a5, pinning the queen. And white ended up winning pretty easily because he's up a queen. And just to point out for you guys at home, the reason white plays bishop d3 instead of not playing bishop d3 is after g6, you don't want to take with the queen because now your queen's not defending the bishop that can go to a5. You want to take with the bishop. That's why he played bishop to d3. So g6 wouldn't save black. Okay. Anyway, Kasparov didn't fall for that. He played knight gf6, bishop to d3. And here, I think grandmasters typically play e6. And Kasparov played, played e6. That's right. Okay, knight f3. And in this position, <clears throat> if I remember correctly, and I don't, but if I did, 
Um, black plays bishop to d6 here, if I remember correctly. And there's many, 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 many Grandmaster games from the 90s and 2000s in this position. And Kasparov played a move that's known to be bad. He played h6. And he claimed it's not computer-like to sack a piece and get compensation. When a computer sacks a piece, that's because the computer's beating you. That was Kasparov's point of view, okay, which obviously has never been the case. And Kasparov was obviously very upset right after his opponent moved because I've seen video of it. I've seen video of knight takes e6 being played and Kasparov going, nah, like he forgot. Okay, very weird. <clears throat> and white sacks a piece and black starts moving his king around. You would expect, Kasparov would have white in this position. Kasparov likes to sack a piece and his opponent's king starts moving around. That's, so Kasparov not known as a defensive player. Now in this position, black has two moves. Black can take the knight or black can play queen e7. And if you look at theory, games that were played before or since this game, or you ask an engine, you have to take the knight now. Kasparov played queen e7, which is another mistake. So h6 is a mistake. Queen e7 is a mistake. And today's engines just say that white's winning now, that this is over. Okay, and white castled. You can't take with the queen because rookie one wins your queen. So you have to take with the pawn. Bishop g6 check. King goes to d8, and bishop f4, and black's position is ridiculous, <clears throat> although he is up a piece. But I got nothing to say about black's position. Black's position makes no sense. The, the rook on f8, h8 is never getting out. The bishop can't move. The king is going to be bad forever. This bishop is bad forever. Queen's in front of the bishop. The e6 pawn is incredibly weak. I have an anchor for my knight on e5. I have c4 and d5. I mean, this is the worst position ever, <clears throat> except black's up a piece. And Kasparov definitely would want to have white in this position. This is very Kasparov-esque. Kasparov having black in such a position, I've never heard of it. Where his opponent's checkmating him and he's trying to survive. <laughs> Unheard of. Okay, he played b5, another mistake. A4, following the Feingold rule, always play A4 when they play B5. Obviously, white wants to get rid of all the pawns, so the black king has no shelter. Bishop B7. The rook goes to E1. The rook's obviously better on E1 than F1. And Kasparov claimed that this isn't how computers play. They don't sack a piece, then they have compensation, and 15 moves later, it's good. He said that's how humans play. So he thought there was some shenanigans going on. Okay, if you have a computer today, the computer is sacking the piece every time. Every computer is like knight takes e6. This is theory, and it's winning if it wasn't theory, and this is great. Computers love white here because they realize the black king <clears throat> is just never going to be happy. The black king is just going to be terrible the whole game. Okay, he played knight e5 attacking the bishop. The computer saw it. Pretty good. King c8, they traded, queen d3 attacking the b5 pawn, bishop c6, and bishop f5, and the pawn on e6 is indefensible. On the other hand, you, you can't let him take it. If, if you're black here, you can't allow rook takes e6. D don't allow that. And well, bishop takes e6 either. So... Kasparov played the engine move. He took the bishop. And now, material-wise, black is okay. Black has a rook and two pieces for a queen. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But black's king is ridiculous. And black's king is always ridiculous. And he played the super sharp c4 instead of taking the free pawn. By the way, white's already up a pawn. And after c4, which obviously is explosive, um, black resigned. And if you put this on an engine today, and I did. In fact, it was today. It was about an hour ago. Um, it said white is plus 7.5. It, it doesn't like black's king. Black's king is going to get totally crushed. Black, black's rooks just aren't playing, and black's king is getting crushed, and there's just no hope. So that's one of the worst games Kasparov's played. <clears throat> Today's engines just say Kasparov was losing right away. 
It doesn't like the way Kasparov defended after he was losing. Is it really Kasparov's type of game? If you look at a list of Kasparov's best games as world champion or before that, you would think he's white this game. This looks exactly like games Kasparov wins. Sack material, destroy the opponent's king with a slow, steady buildup. Kasparov has won many games like this with white. I've never seen him lose a game like this with black where he's just totally crushed. Now, here's a funny line that I just saw, but you guys like funny lines. Let's take the pawn instead of resigning. Now your bishop is attacked and pinned. Let's defend the bishop. Checkmate. I told you the king wasn't too good. And for those of you that are confused, there, there's a bishop here. So he's, and there's a rook here. Yeah. That's just a line that I just saw now that I thought was funny. Okay. And if you don't take the C pawn, D5 is coming, and Queen F5, and CB5, and Rook C1, and ugh, horrible. And this is the kind of position I like to say, <clears throat> the better you are at chess, the worse you realize Black's position is. If you're sort of a beginner, rank player, under 1,000, 1,100, you're like, I have a Rook in two pieces, he has a Queen. And that's all you see is the material. You don't see the King's safety, or the piece activity, or what's going to happen in the next three or four moves. You just look at the material. And <clears throat> if you play this out against an engine, which you can do, you have the power. You can, you can, whenever you want, play black here against the engine and see how long you can last before you don't want to play anymore. It could be here, but it could be you're like, I don't think this is so bad. And then play the engine and then be like, oh, all right, never mind. And probably in like three moves, you'll just be like, okay, let's, let's stop. Okay, so Kasparov completely crushed the last game, and that was the match. He lost three and a half, two and a half, and that was the end of Deep Blue. Deep Blue never played chess again. Now, <clears throat> what I don't like about this is you can't say player A is better than player B because player A won a six-game match. If you want to say player A is better than player B, you could look at a 20-year career and be like, all right, in 20 years, player A's average rating was 2750 and player B's average rating was 2610. So player A seems like he had a better career. But if player A plays player B six games and the score is three and a half, two and a half, that doesn't tell me anything. <clears throat> I don't know who's better. So it's sort of weird to play a six-game match, win the match in the last game, then never play chess again. Like, we're better than Kasparov. All right. <clears throat> so I, I would contend, and I'm human, so I'm biased. I would contend Kasparov was still better than Deep Blue at this time, at this time period. But obviously now it's ridiculous. Now engines and AI are, are spotting material to Grandmasters. Like, take a knight off the board, then we'll see what happens, which I did uh, about a year ago. I played a match with Komodo, 15 minutes each, and it spotted me a piece. And I won 4-2. to two. I was up 3-0. Then I guess I, I collapsed. But I still won 4-2. to two. So if I have an extra piece, a weak grandmaster like me can beat a computer. But if it didn't spot me a piece, if we just played heads up, it would win 6-0 for sure. It's not even close. It wouldn't be like maybe you would get half. No, I would not get half. No. no. Now maybe like Carlson would and those guys, but not me. So computers are clearly better than grandmasters now. It's just a question of how much. At this time, I don't think Deep Blue was better than Kasparov. They were probably comparable. Kasparov won the first game. There were draws. Kasparov resigned in a drawn position. Kasparov was winning and couldn't win. Anything could have happened this match. This match could have gone either way. So this is an interesting match. And <clears throat> for, for historians and for people at the time, this is very exciting because this was the first time a computer won a match against a world champion or a super grandmaster that wasn't happening then. So this was the beginning of, of the end of humanity. Yeah. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that lecture. I'm sure you enjoyed it more than Kasparov did. You can find out a lot about this match and the previous one on the internet and also the documentary that was made Game Over. It has a very ominous cover. When you see the cover of the whatever DVD or whatever it is, you'll be like, okay, that's it. It's Kasparov looking pretty pissed. <laughs>
All right, I want to thank again Patrick Davenport, my good friend and our sponsor. If you want to sponsor a match, contact Karen, karen at atlchessclub.com. I hope you guys have a great new year. Or if you're on YouTube, I hope you had a good new year. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.